If God says it, I'll do it. I want everybody to say it out loud. If God says it, I'll do it. You know, that's the kind of Christian that you want to be, is it not? And today we're going to look at uh, one of the upside down principles of the kingdom. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat that if you don't come into this message with a heart and a mindset of faith, you will leave here frustrated today. But I also believe that if you come in with that perspective today, that you may very well leave freed. Um, You know, I'm not a pilot or anything like that, but I've always appreciated aviation and talked about how I enjoy it. Uh, But one of the few things that I've learned about aviation, and arguably the best illustration for following God that I've ever heard, uh, it has to do with what a pilot's supposed to do when they're going into a stall. A stall is when the plane's beginning to lose airspeed and things are shaking and not feeling so well. You know, everything inside you as a human being, when you're piloting a plane, that is starting to lose speed and go down would be inclined to pull the stick up, right? Because several thousand feet down is a very hard ground that you're going to hit and die if you hit it, right? And so when you feel yourself falling, you want to pull yourself up to, you know, kind of feel secure. But experienced pilots are trained and learned to do early on uh, that what you actually do to get out of a stall is you point the nose down and you go into the stall. And that's why if you've ever been on a plane and you had that feeling where your stomach went up, it's because they did that. And your stomach feels like it's going up. So you go into the stall, arguably feeling like you're going to crash. And then as you go down, uh, the pilot begins to pick up some airspeed and they can level off and try their best to get out of the stall. Um, See, pilots learn that they have to trust their instruments over their human instincts. Um, And the very same thing is true when it comes to our walk with God. God's word is our instrument that he has left us behind to follow. And there are certain things that God will ask you to do in your life that will absolutely feel like you're going to crash when you do it. And everything inside of you will say, I can't do this. It doesn't feel like this is the way things should go. And God says, go into the stall, point the nose down and trust me. Um, And I'm going to go ahead and give you right off the bat the topic and the verse for the morning. And uh, and I'll tell you why I'm doing it right off the bat in just a second. But today we are going to be reading from Malachi chapter 3. It is arguably the foremost passage in all of the Bible on the practice of tithing, uh, which is that practice of giving the first tenth of our income uh, to the Lord. And let me tell you, I'm telling you this off the bat for a few reasons. Um, One, I don't want anyone here to ever feel bait and switched when we talk about something here at City Church. Um, you know, with an emotional appeal at the end of something. We're coming to this portion of the scripture today because we've been trekking our way through the minor prophets over the course of the last four to five months. And um, listen, uh, the minor prophets just happens to bring this topic up quite a bit all throughout it. You know, if you're newer here, or you're newer to Christianity, you know, you might have heard that thing of like, oh, the church just wants my money. That's all they're after. Uh, Let me calm you down. We don't want anything from you. We want something for you Uh, because God wants something for you in your life. And, And I realize as a pastor that we have been talking about this quite a bit as of late. And the reason is because it's come up a lot in the minor prophets. Now, here's our philosophy here, okay? If the Bible brings something up, we're gonna bring it up. Does that sound good to you guys? In everything in life. And also, we try not to overemphasize anything, but when there's a recurring theme in the Bible, uh, we go there if the Word of God goes there. Now, specifically, as I mentioned, this topic is all over the minor prophets, which we've been teaching on for the last several months. So it makes sense that it's come out a lot in our message. Well, I'll give you some good news now. The good news is this is the last book in the minor prophets. (laughs) So we're just about over with it. Um, But let me ask you a question uh, with a show of hands. How many of you used to think one way about something in your life and then you found new information and you changed your mind? Have you ever had that happen? You know, that happens all over the time, all the time throughout our lives as, as, as people and as Christians too. Uh, God brings information in front of you uh, to make a decision and to decide, are you going to think the way you've always thought about this or are you going to be open to a new way of thinking? You know, I think God wants to do that with every Christian in respect to their finances. And early on in my preaching, I'm going to be totally transparent with you. 
I was very scared of teaching on this topic. And I felt like in some way, I had to apologize for or defend this practice, like, I'm sorry God asks about this, or something like that. Uh, Let me tell you something that Kyle version 9.73 is doing differently. (laughs) Okay, we'll call it Kyle version 12.1, because that's where iOS is, so we'll go with that. Let me tell you something that Kyle 12.1 is thinking differently, and I'm just going to put this out to you unapologetically. I refuse to apologize for anything God asks in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, it is my job to teach it and to relay how it impacts to every one of us as human beings. Your job, as it is mine as a person, is to wrestle with God and wrestle with the Word of God and what it means for all of us. Now, here's what I also won't do anymore. I won't comfort something that God wants to confront. And there are times in our lives where we want to build a soft palate for this part of our life that we don't want to deal with. Um, And, and, you know, uh, I believe God may be wanting to confront some of us about this part of our lives today. For others of us, uh, maybe God wants to remind us of why we do it. Um, But here's what I know about everything in the Bible that I've ever come across in my life. We can choose to ignore it today, but eventually it's going to come up again. That's the way things tend to happen in, in Scripture, and, and it's going to come up again and again until we either change our hearts or we harden our hearts. Uh, in the Old Testament, there is this great story of this Pharaoh by the name, uh, actually, I don't know the Pharaoh's name. I know the guy, what's, what's the guy, what's the Pharaoh's name that Moses was talking to? Does anybody know? Anyway, that's an interesting question, but it's a great story of this guy named Moses talking to this wicked Pharaoh, and uh, he's trying to argue with him to let God's people go. Uh, They they were slaves underneath his reign, and God does all these miracles uh, right in front of Pharaoh's face, and every time God does a miracle in front of Pharaoh, instead of softening his heart, he he, he Pharaoh's his heart. (laughs) That's a good way. He pharaohs his heart. He hardens his heart. I'm going to coin that right now. He pharaohs his heart. Um, and, and listen, you know, time and time again, he's confronted with something, and he has a choice to respond, and he hardens his heart. Here's what I tell you, and the reason I bring up this little topic today is if you kick this down the curb uh, to some future tense in your life, um, I promise you it will resurface, and maybe God is bringing it to the forefront today uh, because he wants you to have, and most importantly, to keep a soft heart towards the things that he asks you to do at every point in your life. Uh, Now, let me ask you another question with a show of hands. How many of you have things that, in your life that you wish you could take out of the Bible? Like, you just wish it just wasn't, come on, this is church, you can be honest. How many of you know things in the Bible, you just wish it wasn't there? Um, we all do, and I would argue with you that tithing is near the top of every human being's list. Um, and, and so my job today is to teach you what God's word says. Here's what I will not do. I'm not gonna try to emotionally sway you. I'm not gonna paint a pie in the sky picture of what's gonna happen if you do it. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the word of God in front of you, and I'm gonna ask you to respond not to me, but to the word of God. Does that sound fair enough? All right. But here's the bottom line, that you want to be true of everything in your life. If God says it, I will do it. Um, Now, notice I didn't say like if the preacher gives a halfway decent sermon about it or because the church is asking or there's this need over here or or, or that need over there or uh, somebody else who has something going on in their life. Like all of those are good things to respond to. But what you want to be is the kind of Christian who does what God says regardless of life season, uh, struggle, uh, you know, or personal personal calendar or otherwise, it just says, listen, God, if this is in your word, I'm going to do it. Um, and, and so that little statement, if God says it, I'll do it, is true of every aspect of the Christian life that I've come into contact with. And, and the issue is really this. How does this topic of tithing apply to me in 2018 in light of the new covenant that Christ established for us? And there are things in the Bible, uh, by the way, that we're no longer bound to that are a part of the Old Testament. Uh, you know, the, the, like all kinds of strange things in Leviticus about sacrifice sacrifices and, and like tattoos. Like I got tattooed at church, so I would have messed that one up pretty bad. Um, and, and so the, the short answer is that if something's reaffirmed in the New Testament, uh, that it's something that's still relevant today. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the, the briefest answer I can give you. And, and so God is looking for disciples who are willing to do what he says, period. That's the heart of obedience. So open a Bible uh, to the book of Malachi chapter three, and we're going to look at verses uh, one through 12 specifically uh, today. And as you turn or swipe there, if you
you didn't bring a Bible, uh, download the YouVersion app, click on the More button and the Events tab, and you can find our page. You can take notes online. You can follow the scriptures there. But we've seen three main things from the book of Malachi so far. Chapter one, God says, I want the best and the first of everything. Chapter two, God uh, talks about uh, how every believer is a priest that's called to represent Jesus to their world. And in the second part of chapter two, we saw that God painted a picture of marriage and how he wants it to look, that it's between a man and a woman. And that image is grounded in creation. <clears throat> but most importantly, what we saw last week was that God has a picture for every married couple that he wants them to fight for in their marriage, to keep it the way that he wants it uh, to be. Be. And I talked last week about how to treasure the wife of your youth or the spouse of your youth. But today, the prophet Malachi is transitioning back to this whole offering topic, and that's why we're coming here today. So we're going to read uh, together, but before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in and through it, you continue to speak to us, to transform us into the disciples you want us to be. Give us soft hearts towards you and what you ask of us every day. Open our eyes to see uh, what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And open our hearts that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 5 of chapter 3, uh, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like, refiners, like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. I'll push pause right there. Um, verse one talks about this messenger who will prepare the way. Uh, and that is none other than John the Baptist, looking forward prophetically some 400 years. And then shortly after that, it talks about a second messenger of the covenant that's going to be coming. And again, no ambiguity whatsoever. That's Jesus Christ. And it's so cool to see how 400 years before it happened, uh, you see the Bible in the final book before the New Testament say, this is exactly the picture that you're going to see uh, pretty soon. And interestingly, one of the things that it says about what this messenger of the covenant is going to do is that he's going to come into the temple suddenly uh, to purify it and, and to cleanse it. Now, this is pretty cool to me because it sounds like basically exactly what Jesus did when he came into the temple. Uh, one of the very first things he did in his ministry was he shows up in the temple complex, he turns over the, the money changers' tables, and he comes in with a whip, um, and, and I, it's like it's right there in Malachi 3. It says he's going to come in, and he's going to refine and purify the temple that's rightfully his. Now, one of the things that I love to remind people whenever I talk about that story of Jesus cleansing the temple is he wasn't so upset about the exchanging of monies and things. That was a real need that had to be done. What the Lord was frustrated with was where the tables were placed. Uh, they were placed right in the very court of the Gentiles. In the only space where the Gentiles could come and worship and encounter God, there was clinking and clanking and, and birds squawking and people, you know, buying this and trading that. And it was this distracting environment as opposed to this holy place where people were supposed to be able to go to worship and to pray. So according to John, actually, right after the wedding of Cana, which was Jesus' first ministry miracle, right after that in John is when uh, this cleansing of the temple happens. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the first one that Jesus did. The point that John was trying to communicate is that it is very early in Jesus's ministry. So it's interesting that in Malachi, again, 300 years before, it says you're going to have this messenger in the covenant, and one of the first things he's going to do is go into his temple, cleanse it, purify it, and that's exactly what we see in the Bible. God wants a pure and holy temple as he is pure and holy. And in light of the new covenant, we are the temple of God whom he seeks to purify, which takes me to the next, uh, the first point on the note sheet that's there today that I'd love for you to write down, God wants to purify his people. In Malachi 
3, 2 and 3, it says he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, that he's going to sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he's going to purify the sons of Levi, and they will bring offerings in righteousness of the Lord. The sons of Levi were the priests. Um, Now, when metals are purified, they are heated to extreme temperatures, at which point the impurities rise to the top, and they are cast off uh, to the side. And you know, what I've learned over the course of my life is that when God wants wants to refine the impurities out of our lives, he allows things around us to heat up. The anxieties begin to come up. The fear starts to pop up. All those feelings of, I can't do this. This doesn't make sense to me. And it's at that point that God wants us to cast those things onto him, uh, to trust him with those parts of our lives. Now, another thing that the text brings up uh, is that it's uh, this refining process is like fuller's soap. Now, I, I did some intense research, and it turns out it's the Greek word for the Dove brand of soap. I'm kidding. It's just soap. That's what it is, okay? Um, Let me ask you a question with a show of hands. How many of you in the bathroom have ever mentally judged the person next to you for not washing their hands long enough? (laughs) Be honest right now. This is church. You know, I like look at them and I'm like, didn't your mama teach you the ABC song while you wash your hands? Um, but, but the point was and is very, very simple uh, that a simple yet somewhat laborious chore makes things clean and useful again. That's really all he was getting at. And, and so the point of this is that the, the refining of the silver is talking about God refining the heart first. And, and the, you know, the soap is the hands. Uh, and so the idea is that we need to cleanse our hearts as well as our hands to bring a useful offering to the Lord. Um, because the heart is where God wants us to obey from. Um, and the hands are how we respond to what we do from our hearts. And once God had cleansed uh, the hearts, uh, then the hands were free to bring a pure offering from the sons of Levi. Um, and Obi talked about uh, a few weeks back how the sons of Levi were allowing all these improper offerings to come forward. And God's saying, listen, all you have to do uh, is cleanse your heart about how you think about it and cleanse your hands of what you actually allow and do. And so God God was telling the people then that if the practice of allowing these half-hearted offerings was corrected, that he would receive their offerings with favor again. So all it took was a simple step of repentance from the heart and a somewhat laborious, simple change, and boom, God would receive their offerings with favor again. Everybody was back on track. And the same thing is true for us today. Um, You know, all it takes is a simple act of repentance in our hearts and a simple change in practice. Um, And I encourage you not to overthink the changes that God wants you to make in your life. You know, my experience in my own life is that God deals with us in change uh, one issue at a time. And he brings it in front of us. And he says, I want you to think about this. You know, God doesn't overwhelm you with like a laundry list of 100 things that you're messing up. Um, My experience, again, is he says, here's one issue I want you to trust me with. And the overarching point of this first section of Malachi is that God wanted to purify his people by changing their hearts about how they thought about the offering first, and then afterwards changing the actual uh, offerings second. And the same thing's true for us. He wants us to change our hearts about it, and he wants us to change what we do about it. And then this is what he says in verses 6 through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Uh, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Um, So the next section in your note sheet just says what God says about the tithe. And I was very careful with how I worded this section uh, because it's not like what Pastor Kyle thinks about it. It's not what you've heard, you know, some YouTube video that's out there. I want you to really think about what God says 
about the tithe. And the first thing I want you to write down uh, from what we just read is that the practice is grounded in God's character. And specifically in verse 6, it's grounded in this characteristic of God called the immutability of God, which means that God doesn't change. Um, So it's grounded in the fact that God doesn't change. And it says, Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. And That's something to think about as to whether it applies to us or is relevant in 2018. Um, You know, when something is grounded in the character of God himself, it's something incredibly important. And one of the primary reasons that marriage is so important to God is that it's grounded in creation. It says uh, male and female, he created them. My point that I'm trying to make to you is the tithe uh, is pre-Mosaic. It was before the Mosaic law. You see Abraham do it. It's Mosaic. You see it there. Uh, you also see it in the New Testament. Jesus reaffirms it in opportunities where he could have said, hey, you guys don't need to do this anymore. Paul, the leading writer of the New Testament, talks about it quite a bit um, in this radical sense of generosity even. So this practice is absolutely relevant to every Christian in 2018 as a new covenant practice. Further, it's one of the primary ways, and this is what's most important, it's one of the primary ways where we keep our hearts connected to Jesus' most important and treasured work of ministry. Because Jesus was the one, after all, who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Um, And here's the second thing I want you to write down that God says about the tithe. Um, People have always and will always struggle (laughs) with the idea. Um, And that's not an excuse to stay there. See, we talk a lot here about how we all have struggles, and, uh, but that God loves us enough to not let us stay in our struggle. He loves us enough to give us the way out of it, um, and he loves eno- us enough to tell us where uh, he wants us to, to change things or think differently. And in Malachi 3.7, it says this. I think it's an honest statement. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my commandments. So people have been having a hard time with this forever, really. Um, And God's people have been struggling with it for millennia. Now, that's not an excuse to disobey God, but it's worth noting that the point is that when people, when God's people are struggling, he wants them to return to him. And that's why the second part of the verse says, return to me and I'll return to you. That's part of the verse. See, God doesn't want to stay far from you. God wants to be close to you. He wants you to feel close to him. Um, and here's the third thing that, that God says about the tithe, and we just read it. When we don't bring the first tenth to the Lord, we're robbing God. Now, I was being very careful of how I said it uh, here because This is not Kyle's words, a pastor's word. This is what the word of God says. Again, my job is to deal with the text, wrestle with it, and point us to God. Um, And and the people ask, well, how are we robbing God? And he lets them have it. He says, in your tithes and contributions. In other words, they weren't bringing that first tenth forward first. And the second thing they were doing was they were allowing these sloppy leftover things going on. Uh, But here's the principle we saw in week one that we've seen all throughout the New Testament and the book of Malachi and the Minor Prophets, um, that God wants the best and first. Um, He, he, uh, you know, I've heard it also said that a tithe isn't a tip to God, you know, at the end of the month when things have gone okay for us. Um, God says if we don't do it, that we're robbing him. And here's the, the fourth thing God says about the tithe, and I want you to put this in front of all of us today, is the purpose of it is to supply the needs of ministry and the work of the gospel. Um, you know, in those days, it was the actual food that the priests would eat. And the, whatever was left over that they didn't eat, they would sell it, and they would use those monies to keep the temple complex going and fund whatever they needed to. Um, but today, it supports the needs of the church in terms of staffing, facilities, outreach, uh, making sure that every ministry has what it needs to succeed. You know, sometimes we can sit back and think like, oh, they look fine here. Like, they don't need my help. Uh, let me tell you, uh, everyone's contribution, no matter how small it may seem, uh, matters to God, and it matters to this church. And it would be amazing uh, what this church could accomplish for the kingdom if every Christian in here would take this part seriously. Um, So what I want to do now is talk from the perspective of a dad. Because I'm a dad now, and I understand 1% of what it means to be a good dad. (laughs) But the Bible calls dad our heavenly father, doesn't it? Or it calls uh, the heavenly father, what am I trying to say? The Bible calls God our heavenly father, does it not? And so in that way, he's dad. Well, here's what it boils down to, and I want to have you write a couple things down. First thing I want you to know is dad loves me. Malachi 1, 2, that's the first thing it says. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Past tense, present tense, future tense, 
God as heavenly father, as dad, he loves you. And that might sound cliche or trite, uh, but let me tell you that anything that a loving parent asks of their child is for their good. And um, when you love someone, you don't want something from them, you want something for them, right? And so God asks this because, and stemming from the fact that he loves me, here's the second thing about dad that I want you to know. Dad owns everything, and he has access to more than I'll ever need or want. I want you to read the exact wording of chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. He says this, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. That's such a cool wording that God would open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you and I a blessing until there is no more need. Uh, Anyone else like stoked on that? (laughs) That's a cool thing. Uh, But here's the thing though, I need to kind of correct a little bit of a false teaching that's out there, especially as it pertains to to giving, uh, that associates and automatically equates a one-to-one equation with blessing meaning more money. Now, don't get me wrong. I have seen God meet extravagant financial needs here in the church, personally, in my own life, um, and in many places as a response to, I believe, this obedience in this part of life. But that being said, I do not believe that every form of blessing that God sends to us is financial. As a matter of fact, was it not our Lord Jesus who said, it is more blessed to what? Give than to receive. And so sometimes there is blessing simply in the releasing of that which we think belongs to us that God says belongs to him. Sometimes uh, that sense of blessing is a satisfaction that says, man, I've done what God asked of me. And I'm, I, that's a good thing. And um, when it would have been easier to do it my own way. Sometimes the reward is like this shared sense of ministry accomplishment. You know, when you've seen God pull through in your life, or in some goal that a team was working towards. Um, I also believe that sometimes it is a financial sense of blessing. But here's what I have kind of, like this is the Kyle definition. Now it's not the word, this is my personal definition of blessing. Um, Here's the definition of blessing that I've lived with over the years. And I explain it this way, more than enough at the end of the month. And I'm not saying Every month on every ledger sheet always winds up that way perfectly because sometimes life happens, doesn't it? But if more often than not, at the end of your day, you got more food left over, you're putting stuff in the Ziploc, you know, containers, and uh, at the end of the day, if you're able to meet your core needs, uh, that is what I would call blessed, more than enough at the end of the month. And in Matthew 14, uh, there is this amazing story in the Bible that um, if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you've heard, but probably even if, you're, if you haven't really known about Christ your whole life, you've probably heard this story too. It's a story about when Jesus feeds 5,000 people. You guys know what I'm talking about? And uh, it's a story, he, he shows up to this particular place and he's been teaching all day long, and like the, the, the message and the preaching, you know, has just been like unheard of. Like imagine if Jesus Christ were the preacher here at this church, right? Pretty good Sunday in church, yeah? Amen? Um, and so don't feel too disappointed. Sorry, I, you, you get what you get here. Sorry. Um, but the disciples come to, to Jesus after like a long day of prayer, and, and they're like, you know, Lord, the preaching has been phenomenal. Jesus, I mean, man. Wow, Jesus, we, we couldn't have envisioned it any better, but Jesus, it's been a long day, and the people, like, they're getting tired, and, you know, they're also getting hungry and hangry. Uh, Jesus, tell them to go home. <laughs> We're tired of dealing with these people. <clears throat> so Jesus looks at them, and he says, okay, why don't you feed them? And they're like, well, Lord, I mean, you know, we would. That's a great idea, Lord. I love your full of possibilities. And I, that's awesome, Jesus. But um, like, we don't have any money. You know what I mean? And if we did, it would maybe be enough to feed us 12, but we don't have enough to feed these 5,000 people. Lord, you got to tell them to go home. 
And this little kid overhears the whole thing. And by the way, sidebar, isn't it an amazing thing what God puts in the minds and the hearts of children? And he comes forward and he says, I got this little lunchbox and there's five loaves of bread inside and there's two fish. And Jesus looks at it and he says, that'll do. I can work with that. And the Bible says that he opens up that little G.I. Joe lunchbox that he had. And it says he blesses it and he breaks it. And in that plot process of, of, of blessing it and breaking it, that Jesus multiplies what was there, puts it into 12 baskets. And with those 12 baskets, the 12 disciples take it all around the room and are able to supply the needs of everyone who came until Matthew 14, 20 that says, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the second part, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. See, that's the definition of blessing that I've always lived with in my life, that if at the end of your month you have more than enough, you are blessed. You know what the problem is? Many of us haven't learned to be satisfied in the Lord. And so, of course, it would make sense that God goes after this very thing. And, and you know, it would make sense that God would ask us to make repetitive financial sacrifice because otherwise uh, we, we may never understand what it is to feel satisfied in the Lord. And God wants to fix that mindset. Um, God wants you and I to understand that he is God and that he has access to more than I could ever need or ever want and that God is able to take what I have and teach me how to use it better, uh, to use it more effectively for the kingdom. And God's able to uh, change my perspective of what I have and understand that he wants me not to look at it with this is never gonna be enough, I'm never gonna be able to do it. But see, God God wants to change that mindset to a mindset of multiplication, where God can take the little we have and make it more than enough and go uh, uh, just feed your own life and the purposes of ministry. And, and here's the, the, the third thing that dad says about the tithe. Dad says it's good for me. Dad says it's good for me. You know, this is the only place in the Bible where it says we should put God to the test to see if it's true. Uh, it's not a light thing. Like, listen, Everything that we do in here is about faith, is it not? Like by faith, we believe God created the world. Now, we might disagree about how that happened. I'm not gonna get into a discussion about all that today. But by faith, we believe God created the world, right? Show of hands, how many of you were there? I'm surprised. Uh, none of us, right? Uh, like, like by faith, we believe that God set up this Old Testament sacrificial system and that, you know, when, when they would, the people would, would slaughter this innocent goat or, or lamb or whatever it was, uh, that this, their sin would be cast to it and they'd be absolved. And, and by faith, we believe that this man by the name of Jesus existed, right? And that by faith, we accept that this man named Jesus wasn't just a man, that he was actually the son of God. And by faith, we believe that Jesus died on the cross, but by faith, we believe that he didn't just die on the cross, that he actually rose from the grave so that whoever should believe in him wouldn't perish, but would have everlasting life. So by faith, we place our eternal security in this Lord. So at the end of the day, I have to tell you, uh, this practice of the tithe is going to come down to believing in this God of the universe who loves me, who creates created me and who says, listen, this is good for you. And I want you, in fact, to try me to see if it's real. Um, listen, sometimes people want me to backpedal here and say, you know, pastor, you need to be sensitive to what's going on. Well, I am. Uh, and I am also sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I'm sensitive that I never want to squelch something that God wants to speak to you. And I have also walked through this now for years as a pastor with people. And I have found that people who trust God with this experience in their life experience the greatest spiritual growth in the shortest period of time. And within the church, I've also found that people who get involved in this get, get and find belonging the quickest because it turns out that what Jesus said is true, that when your treasure starts going somewhere, your heart follows it. And you want to know, hey, like, I want to be a part of this. I'm all in, Lord. My chips are on the table. And, and if dad says it's good. It's because he loves me. He has more than, uh, more than access to more than I'll ever need or want. You know, I want to leave you with a story. 
And it happened uh, about a month ago with me and Nigel, and it was a, I think it was a Sunday after church, and we're sitting out outside, hanging out on the patio, as we often do. And Nigel asked me for his favorite little treat, goldfish. And parents, you can leave your nutritional judgment at the door, please. We don't give them to him all the time. But when he asked every once in a while, we're like, okay, cool. It, he just loves it. And so I always do this same thing when he asks for goldfish. I ask him, I say, buddy, do you want a little or do you want a lot? What do you think he says? A lot. He gets so excited. And, and I take this like tiny little baby bowl thing and, and I barely fill it, fill it a third full and Nigel thinks he hit the jackpot every time. Um, a, a little sidebar here. You know, sometimes a loving dad has to decide when en- enough is enough for their kids, right? And that's just something to, to think about. And, and anyway, uh, he always says he wants a lot. So I give him this bowl and, and you know, he starts digging into it. And I look at him, and I say, Nigel, can I have one? What do you think he said? No. (laughs) And it wasn't that kind of no that was like joking. It was that like, how dare you ask that father? (laughs) And, And so then I ask him another question. I said, Nigel, who gave you the goldfish? And he looks at me. And he says, Dada, <laughs> like straight away. And, and so I ask him again, so could Dada get you more goldfish if you needed them? Yeah. And so I ask him another question. Nigel, can I have one? Nope. <laughs> okay, now let me, let me just un- back up here for a second. He's two, okay? He's going to get it at some point in his life. But I know at two, he understands this. He knows Dada loves him. He knows the goldfish come from Dada. He gets that part of the story. And that Dada could bring him more if he wanted to. But what Nigel doesn't know is that, man, we have like a costco size 15-year supply box in the pantry. You guys know the one I'm talking about? I mean, I could just flood the table with goldfish if I wanted to. Uh, And and see, to take this illustration to the next level here, you know, God owns every Costco that sells those massive goldfish boxes that people buy. Even further, God owns the goldfish creation process and all that that's ever gone on to feed American families these unhealthy treats. And God has no shortage of limitation when it comes to providing for his beloved kids. I guarantee you. He's a loving father. And all dad asks is for one goldfish out of ten. You know, everyone in here should have gotten a little Ziploc bag full of goldfish. If you didn't, you're like, some of you are like, oh, thanks, I already ate them. (laughs) Perfect. Um, You know, and I just, there's ten of them in there and with a little card that just says, can I have one? And I believe that is God's foundational question that he asks every single one of us. You know, he loves us beyond measure. Uh, He has access to more than we could ever need or ever want. And God, as heavenly dad, says this practice called tithing is good for me. And so dad says, I want you to try it. And maybe, just maybe, dad wants to open the window of heaven for you and open up a blessing until There is no more need. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, try me on it, see if it's true. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are a generous God. And Lord, we thank you for provision in our lives. We thank you for how you've taken care of us as a church, uh, God as individuals. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for how you've met extravagant needs in this congregation and will continue to do that. And so, Lord, now I pray that you would give us the faith to trust you with this aspect of our lives, too. And if you're in here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, maybe you've been window shopping the Bible and God and the claims of Christianity, but if you were to walk out the doors of this church, you genuinely don't know if you would call yourself a Christian and go to heaven when you die. I believe that God brought you here today to settle that question once and for all. You know, God says in the Bible that he'll do four things for you. He'll forgive you of all your sin. He'll adopt you into his family. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit so you can live the life he's called you to. And finally, he'll offer you an eternal life that's beyond anything that you could ask for, dream, or imagine. There's only one catch. 
Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so I'm going to give you the chance right here and right now to make Christ the Lord of your life. Uh, maybe for the first time, it isn't mystical, it isn't magical. God hears the faith. I encourage you to pray alongside me in your heart if that's you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sin and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. God's people said, amen.